Good afternoon. Delighted to spend a bit of time with you all today. Today, we're here to talk about equity, to continue to build on a foundation of awareness around the ways bias shows up in talent processes and performance management systems within companies, with hopes that it might also set a foundation for deepening allyship among you within the Harvard community as many of you emerge in your careers in both the workplace and or academia. So let's, let's consider the, the current backdrop, right, before we dive in. This current moment has been defined by so much complexity, right? During the past 18, 20 months, compounding crises have surfaced and exacerbated inequities that have existed for far too long. Um, the world has, has awakened to systemic issues, right? Opened to courageous conversation around race, ethnicity, and this global pandemic has, has called, caused rapid human loss, prolonged economic disruption. And, you know, we've been remote for a very long time and it's accelerated a change in the way that we work. So we've all heard this call to action, right? CEOs, corporate leaders are leaning into change, seeing an obligation to transform culture, root out inequity, looking for education and frameworks, guidance, ultimately so we can all see how we can be better together. And stakeholders across the business community are looking to move beyond rhetoric to action, working to determine the best pathway forward. And many organizations are just trying to figure out where to begin. So let's, uh, let's start by some quick level setting. <clears throat> First, a quick level set on what equity is. Equity offers the vision of a workplace where every individual has what they need to fulfill their potential, right? It refers to opportunity, access, resources. You know, this, this definition from the Center uh, for the Study of Social Policy reads, equity is the effort to provide different levels of support based on needs in order to achieve fairness and outcomes. Working to achieve equity acknowledges unequal starting places and need and a need to correct, uh, correct uh, some type of imbalance. So our research at Coquel, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, focused on equity, places a you know, major focus on, on fairness and the idea that we must differentiate, right? We must understand what the needs are, the challenges and barriers for different groups to ultimately provide the right support and pr pursue greater inclusion. So, you know, when people believe, you know, there are, there's, there's equity, right, uh, at work, they're more likely to trust the company's culture and its leaders. <clears throat> so this year, we obviously leaned into, this past year, leaned to a, a series of three studies focused on equity. And, you know, our research looks at uh, talent systems and the broader structural realities that create barriers to success and advancement in the work environment. Coco considers uh, institutional and interpersonal con uh, contributors, realities that impact one's ability to thrive and be rewarded fairly for their contributions. And these rewards come in various forms, right? Development, fair compensation, promotion rates. And to direct us in this endeavor, at Coquel, our research team, we, we grounded our thinking in a framework from, from social psychology called the culture cycle. Um, so we leveraged this, this existing framework, uh, slightly adapted uh, the four I's, ideas, institutions, interactions, individuals. Um, and, you know, this, and, you, you know, and this report, um, you know, focused on, uh, you know, the role of the first report focused on the role of the employer, right? We really looked at the, the, the talent system as a body um, that sets uh, policies and processes 
that impact equity. And then in the second report, we turned our attention to uh, you know, fairness and in inter interpersonal dynamics, uh, the day-to-day -day experience that impact one's ability to, to access opportunity for talent across different backgrounds. Now, as far as methodology, uh, we, we conducted this study, um, uh, mixed methods, um, a, lit, a lit review, a combination of a nationally representative uh, survey of professionals in the US, as well as focus groups and interviews to put those kind of findings into context. Um, and that's our typical process. Now, interestingly, you know, as we, as we uh, you know, started this process, we, you know, we spent a little time, you know, talking to HR practitioners. Um, and we spent time um, across the HR function, right? So not only diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders, but also talent acquisition, HR business partners, leaders within compensation and benefits, learning and development specialists. And, you know, it was really important and given the, you know, kind of commitments uh, to equity and, you know, kind of concerns around momentum that we, we've been hearing from so many of our companies, our research team wanted to hear um, uh, from HR, uh, HR practitioners, what's getting in the way, right? What are the real barriers um, to action around um, driving greater equity, driving um, more inclusive outcomes? <clears throat> Number one on the list was lack of adequate resources, right? Many, many um, uh, leaders felt they didn't have uh, the staff or the budget they needed to really drive action. And this was across, um, uh, across the, the HR um, uh, function. Many felt that they didn't have, you know, kind of uh, DEI knowledge that came up as well, or the information they felt they needed at their fingertips. And then, of course, uh, you know, one uh, significant challenge was, you know, not having buy-in or having uh, senior leaders they felt didn't really understand uh, DEI. Um, or the task at hand, um, and, and in some cases, HR leaders feeling they just didn't have the support they truly needed to transform some of the processes that might be fueling bias and barriers within their organization. <clears throat> so we found this disconnect when we were speaking with, with, with uh, uh, HR practitioners, right? Um, so wanted to understand how resources are being used, right? That's where this disconnect uh, arose. When we asked DNI professionals <clears throat> and HR practitioners, you know, what they see as the biggest area of inequity within the talent life cycle, the number one response was promotions. And then when we asked where the resources were primarily being focused within an organization, the answer was hiring. Right, so there's this disconnect where they see, uh, you know, uh, the biggest areas of inequity and where it's falling in this advancement promotion area, but most of the resources are being focused on, um, on hiring, right? You can't solely um, focus all of your time and, and energy on talent acquisition. You also have to understand the lived experience uh, once talent comes through the door, right? How are underrepresented groups being developed, advanced through the organization, right? So um, it was really important there, uh, you know, during our point of departure. <clears throat> So our research, in our research, we looked at performance evaluations, promotions, pay. And we started with um, evals because uh, performance assessments are the gateway to everything else, right? Pay, opportunities, sponsorship, advancement. And studies have been done to examine um, some of the bias that shows up in evaluations. We know gendered stereotypes um, impact language used, for example, um, and men are more likely to be rated as having leadership uh, potential. We wanted to explore what employees today um, are sensing, right? Do they feel like they're being evaluated fairly? And so, you know, our findings show there's some inequity, right? Black and Latino professionals feel they're being judged by different criteria than their peers, right? In fact, Black and Latino men are, uh, you know, um, are more likely, twice as likely, to say they're they're evaluated on different criteria. And then the same holds true when you look at women of color. 
um, uh, though at lower rates. When we asked respondents, um, you know, if they felt that their evaluations reflect their contributions at the company. As you can see here, Asian professionals are, are, are least likely to feel their evaluations match their output. And what we've heard qualitatively was that Asian employees, you know, often feel their work is overlooked, right? They don't always receive credit for the work that they contribute to. And our research team has heard time and again in previous studies and current studies from our Asian professionals that, you know, they can be seen as subject matter experts, but not as leaders, right? Um, uh, and we were, we were surprised to see kind of high rates of a response here for Latino professionals. So we dug a, a bit deeper. And we see that colorism comes up as a relevant factor here. Latino professionals with darker skin were far less likely to say their evaluations reflect their contributions. Some Latino professionals with lighter skin, or perhaps perceived as white, whether or not they identify that way. And these perceptions lead them to be treated more like insiders, right? You see that 72% uh, for lighter skin respondents and that moved down to 46% for those of darker skin. And we've known this from previous uh, COCO research, right? Um, uh, that uh, you know, professionals of color are more likely to be discounted for their contributions you know, um, shows of Black and Latino talent, you know, have uh, their competence questioned in the workplace, but it often, you know, uh, gets more granular to uncover um, uh, this colorism, you know, and this nuance often unspoken about in corporate spaces. Now we look at the payoffs. So what happens when employees feel their performance evaluations and the process is fair, right? Um, or more equitable? Well, it leads to increased engagement right? Trust in the company and satisfaction with the culture, right? So those feelings of, of fairness have a meaningful impact, right? Meaningful. Our research team also looked at, uh, looked to understand um, company practices uh, related, uh, correlated with perceptions of fairness um, around uh, uh, performance evaluations, right? Um, and these are the top five things that bubbled up. Interestingly, four out of five of the solutions are about feedback, right? It really underscores the importance of cultivating a feedback culture, a really important feedback culture. And it's worth noting, um, actionable feedback was the only significant predictor of fairness for all groups. All cohorts, all respondents um, valued that. And we heard a lot about the need for feedback and how managers often lack the skills in providing it. Um, 360 reviews, uh, they were a significant predictor of fairness for Black and Latino professionals um, uh, as they experience, evalu uh, the, they experience bias in their evals and are most likely to feel um, th that they're being evaluated on this different criteria. So it makes sense, right, that knowing that in the 360 process, they, would, they wouldn't only be evaluated by just one person, but rather a collective of vo voices that can speak to their work, which can be really meaningful, right? <clears throat> Let's press forward with promotions um, and pay. So, um, <clears throat> and our findings reveal opportunity is not evenly distributed. But first we looked at representation data. Right. This is this is of uh, the U.S. Uh, population workforce as a whole, and you can see here that representation of professionals of color at all levels presents an opportunity. Right. The numbers dwindle as you move up the corporate ladder, and it's stark as you move into senior levels. And indeed, those groups with the biggest drop-offs are also the ones that are most likely to feel they're being promoted slowly. Black and Latino respondents were more likely to feel that their time to promotion was longer than their peers. And this tracks with what we're seeing in regards to representation in the previous chart. Um, you know, and, and, and slower promotion um, may, uh, you know, many, many of, uh, of our respondents, uh, we find that, you know, many attribute this to the fact that they're just being passed over um, for peers who are, um, on par or less qualified than they are. Black and Latino professionals are most likely to report being passed over for promotion in favor of equally or less qualified peers. Black women are four times 
more likely than white women to feel passed over. Um, uh, and and that's it's a it's a very um, kind of pronounced uh, feeling. Um, now it is one of those things we see here. Uh, let's see. Next slide. <clears throat> as we move into as we move into um, the idea of kind of the benefits and payoffs of debiasing promotion processes. Um, you know, what happens when employees feel the promotion process is fair? They intend to stay with the organization, right? They're more loyal to the firm. And given the war on talent um, and what we've been experiencing in, during the great resignation, this retention payoff is key. <clears throat> now, driving perceptions of fairness and promotion process, the top five things that were, sh were strongest predictor predictors, again, shown here, Transparency and accountability are really important across most all cohorts, especially for white, Latino, and Asian professionals. Initiatives linking leader performance to uh, performance reviews, um, um, uh, you know, linking to leader performance reviews, compensation, um, and having those tied to DNI goals, really important. You know, sharing representation data. Um, again, these are top predictors of fairness. For Black talent, organizational goals to promote or develop women or people of color um, and sponsorship uh, for underrepresented talent were the kinds of targets or initiatives that really mattered. Um, and finally, I think clarity, you know, clarity around how promotions work um, at the onset as part of the onboarding process is something that would be really helpful helpful to anyone, most anyone in an organization. Now pay. Now we wanted to understand employee perceptions on the compensation front, right? And, uh, you know, women, uh, we found across the board, perceived their pay to be less than their peers, which makes sense, right? We're all aware of the gender pay gap and the fact that it exists. Black women are acutely aware of this difference in pay. Um, a large concern is, you know, is lack of transparency into how pay decisions are made. And at the intersection of gender and parenthood, an interesting finding, a fatherhood bonus. And we wanted to see if this showed up in our data. There's been a lot of research, decades old, uh, kind of documenting a fatherhood bonus and a motherhood tax. You know, so when fathers, you know, fathers ask for a raise, you know, they're seen as providers for their household, families, you know, who need more income to keep a roof over their heads. You know, mothers, you know, with children seen as a distraction or uh, distracted or a flight risk, right? So we asked our respondents whether or not their managers advocate for increases to their pay. Men with children were more likely to say, yes, their manager advocates for increases to their pay. And we didn't see as much of, sorry. We didn't see as much of a motherhood tax, um, but we didn't, you know, see um, the the same bonus, right? That um, fathers are getting, right? Women as a whole aren't seeing the same level of advocacy that men are. Um, and then, you know, we we also saw a class tax, right? Our findings revealed a class tax. Professionals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds were more likely than those from higher class backgrounds to say they're paid less than their peers. And of course, intersectional, intersectionality matters here. Um, we see the gap is most pronounced for black professionals, right? Um, uh, and, and social class is kind of a powerful force in terms of success. You know, we've heard, you know, we heard, you know, that from, you know, those from higher class backgrounds more likely to, um, know the unwritten rules, right? Um, so just how to negotiate for higher pay. Now, we think of payoffs and increase in perceptions of fairness in kind of the pay process corresponds in a boost in job satisfaction. Also in a feeling, um, you know, like the employees have a voice at their company, right? When we're paid fairly, we feel seen, 
we feel valued by the organization, right? And we're more likely to bring our ideas and our opinions for, forward. And so it's no surprise here that pay equity analysis matters. For some employee groups, Latino professionals, they're looking for um, you know, the analysis, not, not only the analysis um, uh, by itself, but also they want their company to, to be vocal about the commitment to pay equity and to closing the gaps. You know, for talent, you know, fairness is also linked to openness about salary ranges, kind of knowing the band and where you fall in it. And overall, you know, fair, fairness and, and pay is linked to transparency. As you can see um, with executive pay uh, and other items, you know, on this list. This quote really hits home, right? Pay and equity is an indicator of deeper problems in processes. It's a flower in a garden. And if you don't inspect the roots, if you don't change your processes, it's going to affect the flower every year. The roots, understanding where systemic bias might creep in, where it's creeping in elsewhere in that talent life cycle, right? And, and getting at the roots is a perfect transition into thinking about individual interactions that create barriers for some groups. So, you know, let's let's uh, let's look at the current state of interactions, right? <clears throat> that apply generally to all colleagues, right? Among peers, managers, leaders. So, where are things falling short for employees? of a variety of backgrounds in the current workplace climate. What we find is for many professionals, work can feel unfair, right? Many members of underrepresented groups, marginalized groups experience unfair treatment and they think that treatment is directly linked to their identities. This applies to employees across lines of difference. And as you can see on this slide, right? Race, ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ uh, identity, age. For example, one in three black professionals feel they've been treated, they've been treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. And we often get the question, well, what if they're wrong? What if they haven't been treated unfairly? You know, and, and, and the cocoa answer is, well, perception is reality, right? If someone feels they're being treated unfairly um, or differently, because of their gender, for example, they will respond accordingly, right? It may lead to disengagement or attrition, departures, you know, um, uh, you know, at, at worst. And 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 furthermore, often these headwinds are real because there are these systemic obstacles to advancement and cultural norms that privilege some over others. These are facts put some on, on uh, the career fast track and leaves others behind. So what we found in our study, you know, um, for black and Latino um, uh, employees, <clears throat> you know, the fear of unfair treatment extends beyond their own career prospects. We see this stereotype threat. So the pressure is even higher because these employees are often operating under the fear that any mistake that they make will reflect poorly on others of their same background. Look at the difference between uh, uh, you know, black and white, nearly th three in 10 black employees versus one in 10 worry about stereotype threat. So you set this super high bar for themselves, right? So if they're being, being treated unfairly, judged on different criteria, or they don't succeed, they worry about the message that sends to other black professionals about their opportunities or lack thereof. <clears throat> um, and and uh, I mean, it could be a very, very kind of powerful, powerful and harmful thing. And at Coco, we always work to um, look at uh, our work intersectionally. The data from survey respondents with disabilities was quite sobering as well. 
they're more likely than other professionals without disabilities to experience a litany of slight snubs and exclusions, um, uh, you know, behavior at work that amplifies uh, that exclusion, things like being left out of meetings, having their intelligence uh, underestimated. And these things add up, right, to an unfair day-to-day -day for employees with disabilities, whether uh, that disability is visible or invisible. And then for LGBTQ professionals, we saw some nuance, some nuances in the data as well. Not surprisingly, they, they experienced some micro, microaggressions, um, you know, more likely to, to be asked to do kind of office housework or to be assumed to be more junior than they are in the work environment. And from our belonging study, we know that the LGBTQ community is more likely to be experiencing anxiety at work, right? And it's compounded at the intersection of race and gender, in fact. So in the, in the report, what we, we touch on, um, you know, on inequities, with other groups as well, um, parents, non-parents, veterans, um, and uh, we take, take a much broader look um, at the intersections. But given our time together, uh, time is limited. I definitely wanna move, move forward and focus on, um, you know, team leadership. So now looking at where managers can be either the wind in your sails or a drag on career progress. And when it comes to handing out work, which impacts employees' ability to develop, stand out, demonstrate a willingness to take on more, majority of white men and women say that their, their work assignments feel appropriate for their level. And that's not the case for all cohorts. Um, that's true for less than half of Black, Latino, and Asian professionals, right? It's the beginning of that fast track, right? Who gets put on the key client? Who gets tapped for that high visibility initiative? The inequity compounds from there. Once assignments are given, <clears throat> it's clear that not all cohorts are getting enough support to complete the work and ensure success on the job. You know, some groups contend with also you know, much higher rates of micromanagement and ex excessive control and scrutiny of their work, especially true for Black talent. We see here again. And so what can we do to reset and reshape team culture, um, you know, to combat inequity? Focus on inclusion and, you know, driving inclusion, you know, when we obviously um, when we were exploring this work, we looked at both inclusive manager and colleague behavior to return to the six inclusive leadership, to return to about, you know, six inclusive leadership behaviors. And our research shows, you know, these behaviors create cultures that spur innovation, drive market outperformance, and to no surprise, they're the same behaviors that also help mitigate bias on teams. It's very simple, six things. If you can model them in your day-to-day, -day, benefits everyone, right? Ensure everyone gets heard. Create safe space for teams to propose you know, novel idea. Share credit for team success. Give actionable feedback. And so be willing to receive and accept and implement feedback as well. Empower team members to make decisions, especially when it's within their scope. You know, no matter where you sit or where leaders will sit in an organization um, or in your institutions, when you model inclusive behaviors, you become part of creating, creating the conditions and the norms that benefit everyone. So this type of recognition and valuing of others is, is linked to greater perception of fairness, um, 
Uh, and let's see on the next floor. And when we quantify this, um, you know, it associated um, with an 18% increase in perceptions of fairness at work. And that's substantial, right? Um, you know, it's that's a substantial increase in the odds of being recommended for meaningful career opportunities and advancement. And inclusive colleagues have a material impact on this as well. And the data, um, uh, and in the data, you know, kind of this, this holds um, for professionals of all backgrounds, right? Um, we all have a really, really important role to play um, in, in being a part of modeling what creates better culture, what will drive ultimate outcomes. <laughs> And we see here, again, having inclusive colleagues beyond managers associated with that meaningful increase of fairness across the board, all around at work. So I'll leave you with a framework. It's a set of you know, equity principles we call stacks. Um, you know, our research lays out for, for companies to kind of hone in on what they might look um, to uh, as a result as a redesign um, processes, um, and you know, few of them are instructive for individuals. Um, you know, beyond in addition to institutions, as we think about our own place in the pursuit of equity, right? Um, which I think is always important in this work. So, of course, specificity is critical. Companies should leverage data to better understand the dynamics at play and talent barriers that need to be addressed, you know, track and measure progress. So that there's, you know, there's an opportunity to be specific around where to, where to start um, organizationally. Of course, transparency, we saw where that, that really benefits. Employees are, you know, they, they, they want clarity around processes and how decisions are made. The decisions that are made and actually impact their careers. So they want to see company um, companies share things like representation data, um, uh, and it's okay. Um, you know, we we spend time with individual leaders often, and let them know that it's okay to be transparent about your organization and what is a work in progress. It's not about having all the answers, but it's important organizationally to signal signal that you are addressing the gaps. Accountability. Employees, clients, shareholders I want to see leaders held accountable for progress towards diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. I want to see organizations really moving the needle. Just, you know, just as this would be, um, uh, you know, an expectation for any business priority, right? Um, again, have it tied to performance. Um, and again, it's, it's a, individually, we can all be, be uh, personally accountable for owning our own blind spots, right? Filling knowledge gaps, committing to inclusive behaviors. But, uh, you know, it's really important, you know, organizationally, um, uh, there's some accountability towards action. Courage, it's there. <laughs> It takes some courage to take action in some cases. Companies really need to acknowledge systemic issues that perpetuate inequity and be ready to at least try to dismantle and overcome those systemic barriers, right? And the sustainability. This work takes sustained commitment. Equity needs to be embedded throughout the organization, tied to values, embedded into core operations. So with that, I just wanted to say, one, thank you for your time. Please know as you guys are um, advancing this work, corporate leaders are coming to understand, what they're coming to understand is that oppor opportunity is not evenly dis distributed. And change requires intentionality and being honest with ourselves about inequity and about who's being left behind. And if we wanna see more equitable outcomes in corporate America, as allies to one another, we have to be willing to lean in with some action. 
We're all on this journey together. So be patient with yourselves. We've all got to find a way to sit into sit with some discomfort, but just know that it's better for us all to show up imperfectly than not to show up at all. Thank you.